Hi, my name is Natalie, and today I'm here to tell you the story about the search for my identity. When people who are close or not so close to me find out that I'm adopted, and that a documentary has been filmed since I actively began the search for my roots, what always follows is a series of questions. I have been answering these questions for years. Now that we finished filming the documentary, I decided to make this podcast, answering each one of them. Each episode is an answer to a question. Now, who we really are and what our true identity is, is a question that humans have been asking themselves since the beginning of time. And still, no one really knows what we're made of. Here, I tell you my story, for now. Now please remember, this is not the truth. This is just my truth. If my story helps you in any way, that's great. So that's it for me, and I wish you a wonderful day. Chapter 8 The Grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, Part 3 Years passed, and as I've said in previous episodes, when my mother died in 2013, and after hearing that one of her last wishes was for me to find my truth, always thinking that I was the daughter of the disappeared, I finally took the courage to speak to my dad. It was important for me to inform him what I was going to do because of the consequences it would bring him. To my great surprise, his response was positive. I had waited 13 years to have this conversation. I had prepared myself in every possible way, expecting any kind of reaction from him, except this one. It looked like in those 13 years, he had had time to think about it and change his mind. His reaction was so surprising to me that I, who never ran out of words, was speechless. It was February 2015. I was about to return to Sweden, but since Konadi had sent emails to me a few months before asking me if I felt I was ready to leave the DNA, I decided to visit them to ask some last questions before going back to Sweden and leaving it there. I wanted to go back to my home, to my friends, to my psychologist, to my work to my place in the world, safe and sound from everything, to be able to process the whole thing better. The questions I had were trivial to the rest of the world, but important for me. For example, if they found a family in their gene bank, how long would it take until my last name was changed? And is my Argentine passport automatically changed? And my ID? And what would happen to my German passport? And my residence permit? And my bank account? And my bank cards? And how long would the whole process take? If I was going to lose control of my identity, I wanted to know, at least on a practical level, what it would mean. After all, a part of me is German, the one that looks for structure and predictability. I went to Konadi with my friend Adri, who had accompanied me the first time I went to the grandmother's, because he insisted. I was actually planning to go on my own. Thank God for those wise friends, who know me in my little capacity to ask them for help and insist on showing up, ignoring my poor judgment. We arrived at Konadi, and they took us to the office of the person who was in charge of my case. It all started well. When we came in, he already had my file open on his desk. I don't remember how the talk started, but I did tell him that I had come to ask him a few last questions. I told him that I was going to leave the DNA in Sweden, to which he said, why don't you leave it right here right now? I calmly tried to explain why, but my answers seemed to irritate him. I didn't understand what was happening, 
but since I was so used to giving explanations in my life, patiently and without getting upset, I tried to be clear and stay calm. Having carried all this trauma inside all these years, in a world that doesn't seem to understand much about it, one of the solutions I found is to explain the necessary so that people around me, in the absence of understanding, at least leave me alone and I can continue in peace with my internal processes. So sitting there that hot afternoon in that office at Conadi, seeing that man's irritation, I tried to stay calm and explain to him why I wasn't going to leave the DNA then and there, but everything I said seemed to irritate him even more, to the point that he started threatening me. And since I would not let him convince me, nor get upset by what he told me, he finally concluded our talk by closing my file saying, if you do not leave the DNA now, I cannot guarantee you that we won't force you to leave it. To which I replied, what you decide to do or not to do is out of my control. Do whatever you have to do, because I'm going to do exactly the same, which is to inform myself. Because that is my duty as the adult that I am. Get informed. Take responsibility. Gather strength. And do what I can within my human limitations. Everything was so unreal. It felt like I was in a movie. He was sitting on the other side of the desk, reclining in his chair with my file close in front of him, like in those scenes where a prisoner, or criminal, or suspect, or even an alleged terrorist captured by the authorities, is about to be interrogated, then to be thrown into the dungeon. And I was there, trying to prove that I came in peace, and that I didn't want any problems, trying to show my innocence. This scene felt so extremely wrong, taking place in the last place one would expect it to be played out. The meeting lasted for almost an hour. Me and my friend, also horrified, got out of the building as quickly as possible. I swore never to go near the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo or Conadi ever again. I thought, I'm going back to Sweden and good luck with trying to find me. Of course, when I told my acquaintances what happened, they didn't believe me, especially in Argentina. And I understand why. After all that the grandmothers, whose children disappeared during the last Argentine military dictatorship, suffered, after having to fight for every millimeter of justice, tirelessly seeking the truth in the hope of recovering the grandchildren, it is impossible to conceive that they could allow any of this to happen. We all do that. We put people on pedestals. We need immaculate heroes, perfect heroes, almost with divine characteristics, because something has to be holy in this world, especially in Argentina. Someone or something has to be able to be beyond the corrupt and unfair reality. Someone has to save us. But in the act of elevating others above everything else, we forget that we are all just mere humans. We are fish swimming in the stream of the forces of society that surround us, erring and learning all the time. We are not infallible. Nobody is. We all do what we can with what was given to us, in the times we are born into. To believe that an entity like the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo is perfect and infallible is crazy. They have done great things. In their tenacious search for the truth and justice, they have accomplished incredible things. And to them, we owe so much. But they are not of divine origin. They're people like everyone else, learning, making mistakes, trying. As I mentioned previously, the Foreign Ministry contacted me in August 2015 
The judge told me to leave the DNA because a case had been opened. Before leaving the DNA, I traveled to Argentina because it was my father's 75th birthday, and I wanted to attend to a party. At the airport on my way back to Sweden, when they saw my passport, they took it away without giving me any explanation, and returned it to me after a while, also without giving me any explanation. That time, I almost missed the plane back to Sweden. Even in 2016, when I had already left the DNA, upon arriving in Argentina, at the airport, they held me in a migration room until they could contact the judge in my case. In the same room, they held another individual, suspected, I think, to have a fake passport. Yes, that's right. They kept me in a room like a criminal. Within an hour, when they were finally able to speak to a judge, they let me go. It was very difficult not to feel like an object all these years. An evidence-bearing object. An object that was stolen in a state of total vulnerability. An object that was sold to a family. An object that had only to feel gratitude for growing up in that family an object that had to give up its identity in the name of the justice of a country in order to find its other identity that was so badly longed for. The news that they had not found a relative in the grandmother's gene bank was not given to me personally. They sent me an email the Wednesday before Easter. They didn't tell me yes or no, just that the result had arrived. I had to wait until Monday to get it. Can you imagine the anxiety of those four days? When I called the judge on Monday, his secretary answered instead, saying, Oh, didn't I send it to you? The result is negative. And he explained to me that they would basically drop the case and stop looking. I asked him to please withdraw my name from immigration because I didn't want them to hold me back again at the airport when I left the country. And he, surprised that they had done it, explained to me that what they should have done instead was simply notify the judge every time I entered or left the country. Nothing more. He apologized for that and assured me that there would be no more problems. Thus ended the chapter of Grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo. With one more detail, which I think is very important to mention. In 2016, I traveled to Paris with Simone to meet the pianist and recovered grandson, Ignacio Montoya Carlotto. He was touring Europe, and Claudia Carlotto, his aunt and head of Conadi, accompanied him. It was an incredible meeting, which filled me with inspiration. Ignacio is a very intelligent, sensitive, talented person and with a wonderful sense of humor. And Claudia, who told me that in times of exile, she ended up in Sweden and hated it, was warm and understanding. She told me that she had heard what happened with the man in charge of my case at Conadi and apologized to me on camera. She told me that he no longer worked at the grandmother's and that the meeting I had with him should never have happened, that she was very sorry for what happened. And that's how things are done. We all make mistakes. We're just humans trying to do the best we can, nothing else. Pedestals have never been helpful for anything. Instead, taking responsibility for our mistakes, become aware of our part in making amends, Yes, that is a true salvation, or rather said, it is our only salvation. Hi, if you want to support Nothing Personal podcast, you can do it through patreon.com slash nada personal podcast or also by subscribing to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts or YouTube. On Facebook, you'll find it as nada personal podcast and on Instagram, 
nada.personal underscore podcast. Or you can find it directly on its website, nadapersonalpodcast.com. This podcast and the theme song were produced by me, Ate Sorilla Luna Music, Stockholm, Sweden. The translation to English is by Jeremy Halpen. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.